Hello, everyone. Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com. This is Trading Simplified. So what are we talking about? Well, we got a couple of methodology and action things to follow up on this week. A mystery chart follow-up. Then we have a new mystery chart, which hasn't triggered yet. So that'll be fun. I know you want to party with me. <laughs> I woke up thinking, you really need to understand what you're really trading. And not to sound all clickbaity on you, but... It might not be what you think, and we'll get into that in a lot of detail. Speaking of which, we'll go crypto hunting toward the end of the presentation, see what's out there. I want to show you a couple of patterns that I'm using, and then maybe we can find some live trades. Housekeeping, I do take requests. It makes my job a lot easier knowing what I'm going to cover. If I can't fit it into this venue, which, as I say each week, is a limited time slot, I can expand in more detail in my weekly show. To join that, DaveLander.com slash webinar. Register even if the date is old, which it probably is. <laughs> and you'll still have access to the current live show. If you need some more information on trading, all the slides from every presentation I've done so far for these Trading Simplified shows, which have a lot of the systems in them, go to DaveLander.com slash stock charts. All right, let's talk about the methodology in action. Here's our mystery chart reveal for the week, and it is SOVO, S-O-V-O. -O. Down there is the trade or the recommended trade from direct from a trading service. Go to www.davelandry.com slash trading service for more on that. Buy at 16, stop at 14.10. IPT of $1,790 for a risk of $190 on a $100,000 account. You would buy 1,053 shares, usually around that one way or the other, obviously. And so far, it hasn't done a whole lot. It's up a little bit today. You can see it was in a really nice trend. It formed what I call a double top knockout, and then that turned into more of a pullback. Go in and watch prior shows for more on the TKO pattern or trend knockout. And the double top knockout is simply when you have a couple of peaks that make like a micro top, and then a micro double top, that is. And then you have like a big knockout bar like this. But anyway, it's set up more as a pullback after a couple days of additional trading. The trigger was here. Stop is down here. And initial profit target is up here. And I'll follow up on this one in upcoming shows. Now, we have a new mystery chart this week. This is an IPO. And as you can see, it's done incredibly well. And now it's pulled back fairly deeply. This is the pattern I call the first deep retracement. Entry is here. Stop is here. And it's kind of interesting. My entry is kind of loose on this, or liberal, I should say. And that's to help avoid getting triggered on noise alone. But I didn't realize after the stock had pulled back a little further that my stop is not below the low. So usually my stop is below the low at least on a pullback. So I'll reevaluate this one over the next few days. And that's the beauty of teaching is I'm able to see things and analyze them a lot more when when the time comes to actually cheap, uh, to teach them. It also forces me to do a lot of research that I probably wouldn't be doing, especially on crappy days. As I've said before, and I've written a whole article on this. If you're interested, let me know. I can get it to you. But on a really crappy day, I'll just want to go home and, and maybe have a beer and forget about it. But because I have to put out a trading service every night, I know I have two hours of work ahead of me, and I'll just put my head down and go at it and bang out, bang through about 2,000 charts. And by the end of all that analysis, not every day, but many days, two things happen. One, I realized that the day really wasn't that bad. Maybe some stocks with big profits just drew down a little bit in those profits. And two, I occasionally find some new opportunities for the next day. And then if I really pay attention, sometimes those new opportunities turn into really big winners. So having the educational business forces me to do my homework. So from a selfish standpoint, I find it helps me a lot. A few years back, and I guess it's more than a few years now, Tom McClellan spoke to us at the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts, AAPTA, conference. And a lot of, lot of great, and, and I don't want to start naming them because I'll leave somebody out, but look, you know, well, here I go. Linda Rasky, Greg Morris, me, I'm kind of humbled to be in the presence of all this greatness. Tom McClellan and quite a few others. But anyway, Tom was talking to our group 
And he had a really interesting presentation where he said, you buy, when you buy a stock, you form a relationship between you and the company. And he went on to say, you expect the company to do good things. You expect the company to have your best interest in mind. And most of the time they do. And most of the time the company goes out and they might not be the best company in the world, but they sure do try hard to do the best they can. And he went on to say, but you're also forming a relationship with anyone who bought the stock prior to you. And the clincher to this is, and those people will screw you. So whenever you get into a market, your much bigger concern is anyone who entered that market prior to you, as opposed to the company itself. Now, I emailed Tom a few weeks later and said, Tom, I loved your presentation. I've been talking about it. It actually became part of this Trading Full Circle course. And I really wanted to thank you for doing that. And I've been giving you credit. And, and just anyway, he says, Dave, as far as quotes, here's another one from my late mother, Marion, regarding market timing. Everyone uses timing in their investing. Some people buy when they have money and sell when they need money, while others use methods that are far more sophisticated or more sophisticated. And that really, really stuck with me. And that sort of dovetails into really understanding how markets work. Now, ask yourself, what's your timing? Are you trading because you have money? Is it because you have some found money, so to speak? As I've been saying ad nauseum lately, when talking about crypto, few years back, I had a brewery, we were moving, it took about half the garage, I needed it gone, and I figured $2,000 would be a screaming bargain, and I had guys fighting over it for that. But anyway, long story endless, next thing you know, I found myself with $2,000, and before that money burned a hole in my pocket, I said, you know, Dave, you're supposed to be this great trader, why don't you go out and start trading this crypto thing? And back then, I was not aware of these altcoins, and I just went in with Bitcoin and Ethereum and then Litecoin. And then I slowly added quite a few others. And then in more recent times, I just went all in on everything else. But that whole trading of the yellow coins all came from this found money. Had I not had this money, would I have started trading all coins? Probably by now, but it's hard to say. The other thing is, sometimes it's not that you have money, but you're feeling flush. And I'll give you a good example of that. About a week ago, I had an incredible day in my positions. And I don't think a lot of them hit the IPTs. These were positions that have been on for a long time. One of them up, up like uh, 20 bucks or something like that. And even though I didn't take the money off the table, I was feeling like, wow, I'm feeling flush here. I feel like I have a lot of money based on what happened that day. And when I was doing my IPO analysis, I saw three or four IPOs that I liked, but usually I'll whittle it down to one and maybe two. And before you do it, I ended up buying all four of those IPOs. And in hindsight, it was probably because I was flush that day and felt like I had more money, especially felt like I had more money than the day before. Now, as Miss Marion said, are you trading because you need money? I have cash accounts where you run out of, you don't have margin in a cash account, obviously. And sometimes you just have to raise a little money in, in, in the margin account, too. If I'm doing a lot of trading, sometimes I might have to call out a couple of stocks because I need money for other stocks. And then lately, I've been pulling a little money off my intraday trading. I try not to day trade too much, but I do some intraday trading. I'll talk a little bit about that in one second. I played, for instance, the opening gap reversal this morning on Meyer, which I talked about in last night's trading service. And you can get those archives at daveletter.com slash archives. So last night's won't be there just yet, but I'll update it as soon as I'm able to put the Put the service there. I can't. I can't put a live service there out of courtesy to my clients. But anyway, so 
another another thing of like needing money is I've been taking those intraday profits or at least half of them and then I've been putting them aside for some projects that we have going around here. My wife wants to put a pool in and I ran my mouth a while back. I know I've said this a thousand times. I ran my mouth a while back about how great trading was going and then when she asked me where money was coming from, I said, oh, we'll just borrow some of our, our own money from ourselves and pay ourselves back. And she goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. You've been bragging about this trading thing lately. How about you chip in? So I have to put my money where my mouth is. And now I find myself peeling off some of those intraday profits. And, and I'm probably a little influenced, at least more now, to take off those positions a little earlier so I could end the day at the profit, at a profit and go home and say, Tell my wife, hey, I was able to pull off a few hundred dollars to go into the pool fund. And by the way, you always need money, right? There's always, there always seems to be an expense. So that's always sort of hovering over your trading. Or could it be something far more sophisticated? Now, my stuff is pretty simple, but you could argue that it's far more sophisticated than having money or needing money are you in a good mood i'm in a good mood today because things are going well and i gotta watch myself because if i'm in a good mood i'm probably going to be buying a lot of stocks i certainly won't be as skeptical as i often am or are you in a bad mood let's say you had a fight with your spouse your significant other or both by the way, who am I to judge? But if you have both, you might not want to be trading. It's going to be a little bit harder to trade when, you, when your mind's not in the markets. But I think we've all been in a situation where we had a little tiff with our significant other and we want to prove our worth because they think we're an idiot. <laughs> and we come into our office, I'll show her, and you do some stupid trading. You have or you don't have time a client of mine's pretty good scalper i'll talk a little bit about, more about him in one second and last week he was on vacation so he found himself trading a little bit more than normal because normally he has a day job he's a he's a physician and then what he'll do is he'll trade the first hour of the day and then he'll go off to save lives well he's on vacation i could all but guarantee he's probably spending more than that first hour in front of of the screen i.e. on a day like today when i'm recording the show and then i'm putting my slides together i'm so busy i might not take a whole lot of trades unless it's the mother of all trades and by the way i'm kind of backing in this here something here by accident i've always said that busy traders make good traders especially if you're following my core methodology go in and look at the current portfolio or take a look at last week's show where I had a snapshot of the spreadsheet. We've had positions we put on 400 days ago or 450 days or something like that a year and a half ago. And there's nothing to do with those positions for the most part other than honor your stop. So sometimes I, I think the busy trader makes for a good trader because he's not micromanaging himself out of positions, especially with core positions that you stick with for a long time. You just walked into the office. I'm guilty of this. I'll go, I'll be hungry, and I'll go eat lunch, and I'll come back from lunch, and then for some reason, everything just looks better on my screens. It's like I need to take a break from my screens, take a look when I get in, but, but don't just immediately jump in and start trading. And this is one of my flaws, and I've identified that. It's like, for some reason, can't explain why, when I first walk in, everything looks great. And I'll find myself wanting to jump in. You're in a, a contest with a client. Well, this morning on the Myra, a client of mine, like I said, he's a good scalper. And he's scalping in and out of Myra. Before you know it, he's up $2,400. Well, I went in and took some options positions. And I took a couple of trades. And I've tried to hold on as long as I can. And I'm up somewhere between, I don't want to jinx myself, $1,200 and $1,700. And, you know, we're kind of going back and forth on who's going to make the most. And it's like, you know, I could feel myself taking a few extra trades that I shouldn't, as opposed to just letting everything ride out, letting everything stop out and go home 
with a nice little profit, give half of it to my wife so she can get her pool. Or I can continue to trade all day and try to beat this client just because we got into a little trading contest today. So the point I'm trying to make is there's a lot of things you do that have nothing to do with the markets. And the secret to trading psychology and understanding technical analysis is being cognizant of your emotional behavior that has nothing to do with the underlying markets. This will really help you to wrap your head around the emotional and irrational nature of others and the market itself. Now, this just in, while I'm doing these presentations, I'm very cognizant of my behaviors and I'm sitting at my, I have a stand-up desk, but I was sitting at my stand-up desk and my trading desk is always a stand-up desk uh, or a fixed stand-up desk just so I won't get lazy and watch a screen all day. And I look over and I saw a position going against me a little bit and I, I have pretty nice profits. And truth be told, I didn't have a complete trading plan mapped out, but I looked at the profits and said, you know, I might just go ahead and take half of that just so it doesn't evaporate. And then I got to thinking, I'm under deadline here. Let me get these slides done. Let me get my recording started. Then, we'll, then I'll mess around with all that. So I didn't exit the trade. And, and I kind of made a mental note that my behavior has nothing to do with the market. And that's where people get confused. They're like, well, what does a company do? And what do their earnings look like? And what is this? And what is that? And it's like, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. It was going up. It looked good. That's why I bought it. So in a nutshell, trading with technical analysis is the use of charts to read the emotions of others while at the same time embracing our own. Now, I've gotten in this before. But real quick, you can't make any decision, even what you're going to have for lunch today, without emotions. And this is based on Damasio and the research of Shaw. And every decision you make, something happens emotionally in your brain. Those people who were unfortunate to have injury or illness that messes up that emotional part of their brain, they can't make any decision. So when someone says take your emotions out of trading, that's BS. You can't do that. You can't take your emotions out of what you're going to have for lunch. If you don't believe there's emotions in something as simple as a lunch decision, ask your wife what she wants for supper tonight. <laughs> anyway, what I'm trying to get to with all this is all you need to profit from a trade is for some greater fools to come along. It doesn't matter what the stochastics say or the earnings or the lack thereof or the fundamentals or whatever. You just need a greater fool or ideally some greater fools to come along and push the price of that stock or other market higher. This is what I showed last week. You can see I bought it right around 44 or so. And I flipped it out the next day to a greater fool at $53 for about a 20% gain and then held on. I think I've since stopped out of this one, but you can see some greater fools, thank goodness, came along, pushed it higher. And the reason I take partial profits is I don't know if there's more greater fools down the pike. By the way, with crypto, I think there are a lot of greater fools down the pike. And I think if you're willing to study money management, and if you're willing to just kind of throw any type of logic out the window and realize you're trading an emotional market, which, by the way, are the best markets to trade because you can't really confuse the issue with facts with things like the fun, funny minerals and stuff like that. But anyway, that's why I'm kind of on this, this crypto kick lately. Now, yesterday when I was working on this slide, I thought it'd be kind of cool to show a trade that I put on a few minutes earlier. So right around lunchtime, I did a rebuy on this trade. And I bought this a long, long, long time ago, about 50% lower. 
and I already took half my profits off. And I thought it'd be kind of cool because this was the strongest pair out of the ones I was looking at that that looked like it was going to continue to head higher. So we'll see. And I'll follow up with this one in, in future presentations. But maybe, and this is one thing I do want to drive the point home. So no matter what happens, I have a lesson, right? If I lose on this add-on trade, then I was the greater fool, okay? So we'll see how that shakes out. So again, emotional and irrational markets are a trader's and investor's best friend. And the reason I said an investor's is because when we're trading the core methodology with stocks, we'll go in for a swing trade or IPOs, which are stocks too, obviously, but the IPO methodology, a little bit different than the stock methodology altogether. The IPO has more of a breakout characteristic to it. And breakouts, as you likely know, often fail in stocks in general, but can work really well in IPOs. But anyway, now, as I say over and over, and I said again last week, the real money is in that second loaf. After you get your swing trade off, you got to stop the break even, and you're free rolling. Then you're able to hopefully ride out a long-term trend. And that's where we get these positions that we hold for a year and sometimes even longer. Nine out of ten times, we're stopped out much quicker than that. But every now and then, it makes it worthwhile. And that's why I put an investor's best friend in here, too. Now, lately, the emotional, irrational, and inefficient market has been in the crypto. And the reason I have the cup of coffee is when we talk about, whenever I talk about inefficiencies, everyone's eyes tend to glaze over. <laughs> but that's where the money is, finding inefficient markets and, of course, trading them. And, and hopefully there's plenty of greater fools. And in crypto, there is. Provided, of course, you're using a healthy dose, dose of money management. So here's the ACP platform. And down here is Landry Light, which shows the number of bars above the 30 EMA or below the 30 EMA. Number of highs below for downtrends, number of lows above for uptrends. Now, crypto had a pretty big correction overnight. So right now is probably not the best time to find relative strength plays. And by the way, if you want these indicators, or as I call them, illustrators, my plugin is, abs is uh, absolutely free. All you have to do is like this video and then uh, click on the plugin down here and you'll have it available. But when you're trading relative strength, the strongest pair is not an indicator, just you're, you're buying the strongest. You sort by a percent change. And for instance, I did buy this SAND, S-A-N-D, this morning. And I'm not bragging because I'm pretty much breaking even on the trade so far. I think I got in around 315. Yeah, 315. So up a few cents. Again, nothing to write home about. Now, one thing I've been talking about lately is the 220 EMA breakout system. And that's something I wrote, I don't know, 25 years ago or so. And it was in an article in Stocks Commodity, I think 1996. Maybe. And anyway, the whole system is just two lows greater than a 30 EMA or a 20 EMA was the original system, but I'm using the 30 now. In other words, two bars of Landry Light. See, like right here, you had three bars of Landry Light. All you need is two, and then enter above the high of those two bars, plus a little wiggle room. So in a case like this, you might have bought in like right there if you're following that system. And breakouts work great in breakout markets, okay, or markets that tend to follow through on breakouts. Right now, all currencies tend to follow through on breakouts, and that's what's making trading them worthwhile. So anyway, if you were using that system, obviously you'd be long this. And go in and watch last week's Dave Landers of the Week in Charts for a lot more on that. It's on my website homepage, and if you register on the website for a free membership, you'll see older shows behind the firewall. Anyway, so this one's number one on the list. I am currently long this, but I'm also long this one, too. And you can see that it's had a nice little run higher. It's up 10% today. If you were trading the breakout system, let's see, bar one, bar two, a couple bars of Landry Light. Entry might have been here. If your stop was at 30, without wiggle room, you might have got stopped out. Another trade would have been bar one, bar two, 
bar three would have been right there. I am not long from back there. I've been trading a lot of other things. And this one has, hasn't caught my eye yet. That one looks a little thin and choppy. So let's just see if we can find something that's kind of break it out. There's not a whole lot today. Because, as I said a minute ago, crypto corrected overnight. So what might have to happen, and this is completely fine with me because the market settled down a little bit. It out, it's a little easier to trade, is go back to just trading, let's say, pullbacks. And let me see if I can find you a good-looking pullback here, something to the 30 EMA, which I call a Landry Light pullback. And we're looking for, in addition to some Landry Light, like you can see, we've got a nice little Landry Light here. We're looking for a pullback to the 30 EMA. You could also use a 20 EMA for this. And let's just see if we can find a setup or two real quick. Now, this one has pulled back. It's a little funky in this chopping back and forth, but technically that would be a setup because it's pulled back to the 30 EMA. Your entry would be up here somewhere. But let's see if we can find one that's a little bit better. And you want about at least 10 bars of Landry Light. Okay, so this one would be a little bit better. You can see you've got plenty of Landry Light in here. In fact, we have, what, 19 bars of Landry Light. And as soon as it touches the EMA, that's, that finishes the setup. Now, I won't always wait for them to come all the way back down to the EMA. But I do like I do like it when they do. If they get extended from the EMA, it's hard for them to come all the way back. In other words, what I'm trying to say is you don't want to wait all the time for them to come all the way back. For those keeping score, bar one, bar two, enter above this high, your entry would have been here on that system. Now, keep in mind that everything works better with trends. So these ones that are really trending, of course, the 230 EMA system would have triggered a long time ago. Technically, Bitcoin is a 230 EMA setup, but it has lost a little steam in here as of late. So I don't think I would go after Bitcoin, but for those keeping score, if you're doing the 230, bar one, bar two, enter above this high, entry would have been here. A little wiggle run would have probably put you in about 50,000. That's a pretty good run up to 65,000 from that. So you kind of get the idea. The point I want to make is you could use some really simple stuff in crypto because it's a very inefficient market. A day like today, though, most everything is weak. Just pick your spots carefully. Wait for something to really, really take off and then look to trade it on pullbacks. Now, when the market gets strong again and everything is kind of going up, then you can go in and trade relative strength. In fact, I bought this one relative strength, probably bought it right here, flipped out half within a day or two. And so far, hanging on to a piece of that to see what happens. But if this one pulls back a little bit to the moving average or has a trend knockout or one of my other patterns, it might be going after, worth going after. So anyway, that's the crypto for today. And as I preach, inefficient in motion, emotional markets are traders' best friend. Technical analysis works the best in those type of markets. I want to thank everybody for watching. And if, if you need follow-up information, the slides for this presentation, all my other, other presentations that I've done for Trading Simplified, go to davelander.com slash stock charts. My contact information, davelander.com slash contact. Again, thanks everyone, and may the trend be with you. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.